Good day, Crime Talk aficionados. This is Crime Talk, and my name is Scott Reich. Thanks for joining us. Quick preview of the docket. A status conference has been vacated in the Lori Vallow, Chad Day Bell matter. Barry Morphew is going to appear back in court for that other pesky little case he has going on. A video has been released in the Alec Baldwin Rust shooting case. Uh, next, we have the day nine of the Johnny Depp trial. Let's see how many people we can... Uh, upset on that by even mentioning his name. A three-year-old was taken from a grandmother's car as she was unloading groceries. Uh, can you imagine such a thing? Uh, no video of the trial of the three remaining George Floyd officers. And then finally, our dumb criminal of the day. Let's talk about it. All right, aficionados, you know the drill. Subscribe if you have not, like the video, leave me a comment and hit the bell so that you receive notifications when we go live or put up new content. And remember, you can listen to us on your favorite podcasting app by simply searching Crime Talk with Scott Reich. As a little reminder, we'll be heading to Las Vegas to set up our little Crime Talk booth at CrimeCon there at the uh, Paris Hotel. Ought to be a fun time. Look forward to meeting many, many of you in person. And remember, tonight is Tuesday, so what does that mean? That means we're going live, 6 p.m. Mountain Time, and we'll talk about whatever you want to talk about, and we'll see if I can, I don't know, offend somebody by breathing. I think that's where we're headed. All right, um, before we get into the today's docket, please support sponsors that support the channel. We'll be right back. Like many Americans, we got a dog during the pandemic. My quarantine dog, Miss Winnie the Bulldog. Now, Miss Winnie has grown accustomed to being around us all the time. When we were leaving the house, Winnie would have extreme anxiety, so we decided to look for natural products to help with her anxiety. We looked for the highest quality CBD treats, and we were not satisfied, and neither was Winnie. So we created a high quality CBD product that absorbs faster and provides the required results faster. Baked in Colorado CBD treats and beverage enhancers are made with nanotechnology. The nanotechnology makes the CBD extraction more pure, also allows for Baked in Colorado products to work faster. Baked in Colorado products can help reduce your pet's anxiety, ease joint pain, and help with your dog's skin problems. Go to our online store and see what Baked in Colorado product is best for your dog. When you order at bakedincolorado.com, enter code WINNIE and receive 15% off your first order. We have a 30-day money-back guarantee. If your dog does not experience the desired results in 30 days, return the product and we will refund your money. No questions asked. All right, let's get to it. Today is Tuesday, April 26, 2022. First on the docket, the court has vacated a hearing that was set for both Lori Vallow and Chad Daybell, you know, the husband and wife duo who are killed of, who are accused, who are accused of uh, the deaths of Lori Vallow's two children, JJ and Ty Lee. And obviously, uh, Chad Daybell is also accused regarding the death of his wife, Tammy. Well, there was a status conference set for April 28th that has been vacated. And I say, Good for you, Judge Boyce. If nothing's going to take place, if there's nothing of substance to discuss, do not set a hearing because normally what happens there is nothing gets done and then we schedule another hearing that usually gets vacated. I can't wait. We're going to have a trial in October. I am so excited. Let's get to that one. Next, Barry Morphew is going back to court. You may say, Scott, what? No, he got his case dismissed, right? No, remember, he had that attempting to influence a public official as well as forgery case for allegedly signing his wife's ballot, or I should say turning it in. Apparently, he didn't sign her name, but he signed under the witness and wanted the ballot to be cast, apparently, that was cast for Donald Trump because Mr. Morphew said Suzanne Morphew would have voted for Trump. He will be back in court on May 26th. 2022 at 8 a.m. and he'll be allowed to appear via WebEx. Well, that's interesting. That's great. Why? That means we can watch too. And we'll bring you all the updates as that develops. Next on the docket, videos, lots and lots of videos in regards to the Alec Baldwin shooting slash rust scene down there in Santa Fe, New Mexico, because the Santa Fe County Sheriff uh, has released files 
from its investigation into the fatal shooting of Helena Hutchinson on the set of the movie Rust, including a video of Alec Baldwin being interviewed after the shooting. Now, in these new videos, he is shown with his hands outstretched, standing solemnly, and that image was taken minutes after the shooting, but before he knew Helena had actually died at the hospital as a result of the injuries where he accidentally caused the um, her death. At the time of the interview, he is not thought to have known that Hutchins had died. If you watch the whole video view, I'll show a link in the show notes uh, below. We've got all the videos up. Take a look. Now, at the start of the video, Baldwin asks if he is being charged with anything. He then lets out a loud sigh and says, we've done this for two weeks and we've done it right every day. He goes on and insists that the gun they had been using before was cold. He continues, she disarmed me. Hannah, she always handled the gun. I come back. They hand me the revolver. Hannah, they arm me. You're assuming it's a cold gun. I put the gag in the shot. I take the gun out. As it clears, I turn and cock the gun, and the gun goes off. It's supposed to be a cold gun. Bang, she hits the ground. Joel uh, goes down, screaming, going, Jesus Christ. Baldwin was somewhat calm but confused throughout the interview, telling the two female sheriff deputies that he'd never heard of anything like this. At one stage, he drew a diagram of where he had been standing in relation to where Helena was standing. Towards the end of the interview, Baldwin is shown a photograph of what was removed from Sousa's shoulder. Shocked, he says, that's a bullet? Somebody put a live bullet in the gun? He's then quizzed in the interview. The police ask him if he had seen the bullet in the gun and what did the bullets look like? Baldwin says, sometimes the head is a casing. It's pinched and closed at the top. And you put the cosmetic round in when you know you're going to see those clay-based rounds look exactly like a bullet. So cosmetically, you see that in the cylinder. He states that he's very upset now. Forgive me. Baldwin was asked if there was anyone who might have intentionally placed a live bullet in the gun. He referenced the fact that the crew strikes at the time and that many of the crews walked off the set the previous day. Now, the body cam footage from the set of Russ after Hutchins was shot was also released, and uh, we have links to that below as well. Now, Hannah Gutierrez-Reed, the armorist for the movie Rust, is heard calling herself an effing failure moments after Alec Baldwin accidentally shot and killed cinematographer Helena Hutchins. She is asked by police if she's the film's armor, to which she responds, I am, or at least I was, then adding, Welcome to the worst day of my life. A female police officer then goes with Reed, whose father, Thel, was also an armor who trained his daughter to the restroom where she is heard saying, I can't believe Alec Baldwin was holding the gun. That's so effed. Reed then asks the officer if she can go to the police vehicle away from the rest of the crew, adding, I just want to get the F out of here and never show my face in this industry again. She then adds, I'm the only female armorer in the game and I just effed up my whole entire career. She also and also released his footage of paramedics frantically trying to save Hutchinson's life. The distressing clip shows the cinematographer's final moments, including paramedics crying out, Hannah, stay with us. She appeared unconscious throughout, having been shot through her right armpit with the bullet that struck her later emerging again through the top of her shoulder. In another video, the crew from Rust, including Baldwin, can be heard asking how Hutchins is doing. Baldwin can be heard asking, what's her story in reference to Hutchins and being told things are a little bit rougher. Someone can be heard asking if the condition is life-threatening and the response is enough to get her airlifted. Now, Santa Fe County Sheriff uh, said in a statement that the investigation by his agency remains open and ongoing as it awaits the results of the ballistic and forensic analysis from the FBI as, as well as studies of the fingerprints and DNA. The sheriff said on Tuesday that charges could still be filed against Baldwin, saying that he was the one that handled the weapon that fired the round that led to the fatality. He added, we're going to work with the DA's office to determine if there is criminal neglect or criminal charges. We kind of know who didn't do their jobs here. That was one of the key questions to be answered. Take a look at those videos. Um, you know, it's interesting. It's interesting. People always comment on how people react after a tragedy. Well, sometimes you don't know the extent of the tragedy. Sometimes people cope differently and they're trying to keep their calm. I think these videos show 
that you cannot make assumptions or judgments that someone did something wrong or was in fact guilty of something based upon their demeanor afterwards whatsoever. People react differently and they oftentimes don't have the full context of the situation. All right, next on the docket, let's try to offend some more people today. Should we talk about Johnny Depp? Well, that's right. It is day nine of his trial. In my humble opinion, this is a four day trial that has gone on and will continue to go on for several more weeks. Now, one thing I will note, okay, because I don't think there's anything really to say about it because apparently everyone in the world is watching this particular trial. But a few notes that I think are worth noting from the comments. First, everything that the attorney says in court is not evidence. Opening statements, closing arguments, not evidence, all right? What somebody says outside of a courtroom to maybe discredit what an attorney says in a courtroom, guess what? Not evidence. The decision has to be made based upon legal and competent evidence that is presented from the witness stand. And remember, the plaintiffs in this particular case, Mr. Depp, are putting on their case. Remember, Miss Heard has sued, so they get to put on their case eventually. So today, let's just talk general defamation law, okay? Now, when a person is sued for making a defamatory statement, the First Amendment places restriction on the ability of the government through its tort law and courts to grant a recovery where the person is suing is a public figure or where the defamatory statement involves an issue of public concern. Now, in these cases, the plaintiff must prove not only the elements of defamation required by state law, but also that the statement was false and that the person making the statement was at fault to some degree in not ascertaining the truth of the statement. Falsity, what is that? Well, a defamatory statement was presumed to be false to avoid liability for an otherwise defamatory statement on the ground that it was true. The defendant had to assert truth as an affirmative defense, right? I said it, but it was all true, an affirmative defense. The Supreme Court has rejected this presumption in all public figure or public concern cases. In these cases, the plaintiff must prove by clear and convincing evidence that the statement was false. Clear and convincing statement is above preponderance of the evidence, but below proof beyond a reasonable doubt. To be defamatory, the false statement must be viewed by a reasonable person as a statement of fact rather than a statement of opinion or a parody. Furthermore, a public figure cannot circumvent the First Amendment restrictions by using a different tort theory to collect damages for a published statement about that which is not a false statement of fact. That comes back to the Hustler Magazine versus Falwell matter. This was a case where there was an ad that Hustler Magazine put up of Jerry Falwell, who was a very prominent uh, minister at the time. And they put up this parody ad saying that he was involved in an incestuous relationship with his mother. He sued. He won on an emotional distress type of theory. Supreme Court said, nope, you can't recover that way. You're a public figure. Basically, anything goes. Additionally, a public official may not recover for defamatory words relating to matters of public concern without clear or convincing evidence that the statement was made with malice. Malice was defined by the Supreme Court in New York Times versus Sullivan as knowledge that the statement was false or a reckless disregard as to its truth or falsity. And the plaintiff must show that the defendant was subjectively aware that the statement that he published was false or that he subjectively entertained serious doubts as to its truthfulness. And further, the plaintiff must show that the defendant was negligent in failing to ascertain the truth of the statement. And if the plaintiff establishes negligence but not malice, which is a high trigger of fault, he also has to provide competent evidence of actual damages. This changes the common law rule that damages would be presumed by law for injury to reputation and did not need to be proved by the plaintiff. 
actual damages may be awarded not only for economic losses, but also for injury to the plaintiff's reputation in the community and for personal humiliation and distress. You also have to show that, but for the false statements, none of these other bad things that I say happened to my reputation and humiliation were only caused by this particular individual that's being sued and not anything else. So that's where we'll leave the law of defamation as it relates to public figures. And since everybody else knows everything about Johnny Depp's case, we'll just throw out the law so that you can chew on that a little bit and um, you know apply that law to the facts. And I haven't really seen a case this divisive in so long. Well, only one I could possibly think of was the Kyle Rittenhouse case where it seemed like people just pick sides and no matter what the evidence was, they completely dismissed the other side and that was it. I don't know why everybody loves Johnny Depp so much. <laughs> I mean, I like him. I like him a good actor. I thought he was good with Edward Scissorhands. I thought he was good as a drunken pirate in uh, Pirates of the uh, Caribbean. I had never even heard of Miss Heard until this case. Never went and saw Aqua Woman, I guess is what she was in. Don't really have a dog in this fight, but I know that pesky thing called the law. Ooh, just gets in the way of the way we feel about something sometimes. But as we've said before, the law, you're supposed to make decisions based upon the law with neither passion nor prejudice. Look at the law, apply the facts, make a decision. You're not supposed to come to your decision and then do legal gymnastics to get to the result that you wanted. It's called intellectual dishonesty. Next on the docket, a crazy case. This just shows you how quickly life can change. Now, federal investigators have joined state and local police in the search for an abducted three-month-old baby who was taken from his grandmother's home as she was unloading groceries from the car. Now, the police say that the baby was in a white long sleeve onesie uh, with a dinosaur on it when a man walked out of the apartment, walked into the apartment, and then walked out of the apartment complex carrying the baby in a black baby carrier. Uh, the police dis posted a 28 second long video of this man uh, calmly walking in front of the house along the sidewalk while holding the baby carrier. He's described as wearing black pants, a dark blue shirt, gray shoes, with white trim, a gray baseball hat, and a black face mask. Now, the family says they don't recognize this uh, gentleman in any way, and as stated, the grandmother took the baby into the apartment, went downstairs to unload some groceries in that short time. Someone entered the apartment, and obviously the images, you can see the baby was gone. Detectives said that the baby's father is currently incarcerated, so they know they don't know if uh, he had anything to do with the alleged kidnapping. I doubt it. They said that they'll be speaking with him as well. And then literally as we were filming this, we discovered that the police have found the three-month-old Brandon Seller, who has been taken to a local hospital uh, with precautions but has uh, been located alive. The police did not elaborate where the baby was located. Three suspects were detained, and the police department noted more details will be forthcoming. Uh, this announcement came shortly after the person had been detained, a person of interest in the case, after the authorities called inconsistencies in her statements to the police about the kidnapping. Authorities then said the three suspects overall were detained, but did not disclose whether the woman was among the suspects. The woman who was taken into custody was the child's grandmother before he was abducted by the unknown man. Police had said the suspect believed to be a Hispanic male who was wearing the black pants and dark blue shirt and gray shoes. He did not appear to be unkept or a vagrant. Ooh, so the plot thickens, ladies and gentlemen. The plot thickens. Next, there will be no video of the trial of the remaining three officers from the George Floyd matter. The Minnesota judge has ruled that the trial of the three fired Minneapolis police officers charged with aiding and abetting George Floyd's killing will not be live streamed. The judge, Peter Cahill, who cited the threat of COVID to allow live streaming of the last year's murder trial of Derek Chauvin, um, wrote in an order Monday that the pandemic has receded to the point that he cannot override the other three officers' objections to live 
um, audiovisual coverage. The trial for former officers Tal, Lane, and uh, Koenig is set to begin uh, with motions on June 13th. Jury selection begins on June 14th with opening statements set for July 5th. Cahill said he expects the evidence phase to take four or five weeks. Tao, Lane, and Koenig were convicted in a separate trial in federal court in February on violating Mr. Floyd's civil rights. And Chauvin obviously pled guilty in December to a federal charge of violating Mr. Floyd's civil rights. Sentencing dates, sentencing dates have not been set in those cases, which were not televised due to the fact that they were in federal court and the federal rules do not allow such recording. And as you may recall, this same judge, Judge Cahill, sentenced Mr. Chauvin to 22 and a half years in prison for his involvement regarding the death of Mr. Floyd. Prosecutors disclosed during a hearing that the other three former officers had rejected plea deals. Cahill wrote that he agreed with prosecutors that live streaming Chauvin's trial inspired public confidence in the proceedings and helped ensure calm in Minneapolis and across the country. And he noted that he recommended to the committee that judges should have discretion to allow audiovisual coverage, even if a party objects. But he said he has no unfettered mandate to ignore existing rules in the absence of compelling circumstances needed to prevent a manifest injustice. News organizations will have to cover the upcoming proceedings mostly by a closed circuit feed in one of at least three overflow courtrooms. Only two pool reporters can be present in the main courtroom and only four members of the Floyd family and two members from each defendant's family at a time may be in the courtroom. The general public can watch from the overflow courtroom and Cahill also ruled that the jury won't be sequestered except during their deliberations. You know how I feel about this. I would live stream every courtroom, every proceeding. It's the public's right to see what goes on in the courtroom. And I get it. A public trial means the courtrooms are open. Anybody can go in and watch. But it's 2022. Let's live stream it all. It instills trust and confidence in the system. And I get the judge is following the rules, but he declared it last time. And if you look at the numbers, the pandemic numbers are about the same of where they were last year. So who knows? But no live streaming yet. And then finally today, our dumb criminal. Please meet Clarence Patterson. He entered a hop and pop convenience store in hopes of using their restroom. To his disappointment, the door to the restroom was locked, but that did not deter Mr. Patterson. Oh no. He then entered the convenience store beer cave and pretended to look at merchandise um, inside the beer cave. Patterson then faced towards the alcohol cases on the shelves, unzipped his pants, and began urinating. Police reported that at least six cases of beer were damaged and could no longer be sold. Patterson was arrested and charged with criminal mischief, a misdemeanor in which he posted $500 bond. Jeez, what are you doing, Mr. Patterson? At least you could have done was gone outside, go around the building, and then maybe at least you get as a public urination charge, but now you get criminal mischief. I don't know, Mr. Patterson, no report of whether you were intoxicated or not. Really? You couldn't have just waited or gone outside? For that, you are a dumb criminal of the day. All right. Hopefully didn't offend too many of you today, but we're trying. You can always join us tonight, 6 p.m. Mountain Time for our live, and then immediately following that, we'll do our Patreon show. Thanks for watching. We'll see you later tonight.